Okay, so today we're here with Mr. Brown, Clinton Brown, co-owner of The Bakery. And I know some of you guys may not know what The Bakery is right now, but we'll let you know. So, Clinton, yes. um, give me two words that describes you. Uh, underslept and overcaffeinated. Mm. <laughs> Interesting. Okay, okay. Those are hyphenated words, though, so I sort of cheated on you. Yeah, you did. You did. Okay. <laughs> now, now, Clint, you're not from Sioux Falls, right? You weren't, you're not born and raised here? No, no, no. I was born in Yukon, Oklahoma. Really? And I lived in, in Oklahoma for 10 years, and then my family moved to just outside of Albuquerque. I lived there for 10 years. And Albuquerque, New Mexico, huh? Yeah. So I, I more identify, I think, because of my coming of age years, my teenage years were in Albuquerque. I certainly consider that home. and. Mm -hmm. identify with that sort of pace and culture okay now i've traveled to oklahoma not that specific city but uh oklahoma can be kind of rural rural so do you like have cows do you you, were you a city guy in oklahoma like what what, what was the deal suburbia yeah so yukon is a suburb of oklahoma city to the southwest there okay and uh, just you know normal neighborhoods and churches and school playgrounds and uh it's a it's a you know, people who live or who work in Oklahoma City, Yukon is one of those little towns out on the edge that they would, you know, go home to. But so suburbia. And then when we moved to New Mexico, my parents lived 20 miles out in the mountains. So they live on the middle of nowhere. So it was a big change to move to New Mexico. OK. Now, how old were you when you when you moved to Mexico, New Mexico? I moved there right. Let me think that I would have just about it was I was 10 years old. I was almost 11. OK. Yeah. Did you have a swing set when you moved to New Mexico? And you'll see why I'm asking oh, you this question. No, 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 no swing no. set. Okay. Too much cactus. I don't know what we, we would have. Couldn't have had a swing set. Here, here's why I asked that question. Yeah. So I've traveled across the United States and I would come upon these houses that would be in the middle of nowhere. And I would ask myself, are there kids living there? And how far are their friends? Like to get to your nearest friend's house, was it like a mile hike? Like how did how did that work? Yeah, so the we lived in one house for a year, and then we moved to the house where my parents still live. Mm-hmm. Um, so in that first house, um, there were no kids around. I don't I don't remember coming across any children ever. And we would drive uh, to a private school all the way in town every day. And so my free time with my younger brother and sister, most of my younger brother, my younger sister's 10 years younger, so she was really little at the time. Wow. Um, but my brother, who's three years younger, was us on our mountain bikes and with the dog looking for arrowheads and a lot of just sort of boys exploring ditches and fields and hills and old abandoned buildings. And then when we moved to the, the house where they live now, um, again, there was, we just did not have the suburban life of kids coming over and knocking on the door and playing. Mm-hmm. My nearest friend in high school was probably, oh, I don't know, maybe nine or ten miles away. Wow. Quite, quite a, I couldn't have walked to anybody's house. I mean, I had to drive or be driven. Yeah. Now, as a kid, was that a boring lifestyle or, or, or is that the way you would have wanted it? Um. You know, having lived both, I mean, in in Oklahoma, there was like a street full of kids and we played like football on the street and and baseball and and G.I. Joe. We get dressed up in our camo and hide in the bushes and all that sort of stuff. Yeah. Um, So moving to to New Mexico was very different. It was sort of a big adventure because we had this like massive freedom in the in suburbia. My parents were very much like, hey, you can go around the block, but you stay close. Like you stay close enough. Dad can whistle. But when we got to New Mexico, man, we had the, they got us a dog and gave us a walking stick and a pocket knife and said, have fun. And so we would roam far and wide to explore. And then really the, the danger was snakes or stray dogs. I mean, there's, there's just nobody out there. Okay. Um, and so, I, you know, I, I love the outdoors. I love mountain biking. I love hiking. I'm not mm-hmm. afraid of being alone. And so, um, you know, I, I don't ever recall like longing. I'm sure we bugged my mom like, hey, no friends can come over. I wish, you know, why can't <laughs> we had to? We were children. Yeah. But I don't I don't look back and that would never cross my mind. of like, wow, I really missed out on having my friends around. I think it maybe meant more like when we got to on Saturday, go over to a friend's house and stay all day or maybe all weekend. 
Mm-hmm. Uh, where my children, we live in the house we live in now. I mean, there's kids in and out of my house all day. You know, yeah. They're all up and down the street. And so yeah, they had to be a little more creative. I mean, we, during the summer, there was like a day we went to the library and we also had to go to the pool that day because you went to town. Mm-hmm. So that's sort of like farm life, but there was no farming. But yeah, I, I think it was just a different adventure. What, was your, your dad like on a witness protection program or something? Like why why New Mexico? Like way out in the yeah, middle of nowhere. Yeah, you know, uh, a couple of things. You know, I, I learned a lot more about um, so my parents are still married, and I, well, you know, have no step parents or anything. They stayed married, mm-hmm. um, but I learned a lot more about my dad's job as an adult than I knew about as a child. He he has what's called a Q clearance, which means he does top secret uh, work for the for the government, for oh. the Department of Energy, Department of Defense, and and those types of things. Mm-hmm. And there's there's stuff I'll never find out just because he he can't talk about it. But um, I learned much later in life that he we lived. I mean, hit, our house was 55 miles from his office. Um, and my mom later explained, I went on a hiking trip with my mom, an impromptu hiking trip. I went out to visit my parents, and I said, there's this, there's this point on the mountain I've seen my whole life growing up I've never hiked to. Let's see if we can get to it. Mm-hmm. We set out with a bunch of water and some snacks uh, maybe five years ago, and we <clears> hiked <throat> up the side of the mountain. And we had this great conversation because it took hours and hours and hours to get up there. Mm-hmm. And... Um, she just said, you know, that was your dad did that so he could decompress. His job was really, really stressful. And he dealt with a lot of really negative things. Mm-hmm. Uh, he was really his job was focusing on terrorism issues in the U.S. And so very heavy oh, wow. topics. And she said he learned when we lived in Oklahoma because he worked at the police academy there that it, those those are negative worlds. I mean, it's just flat out negative what police officers have to do most of the time. And he learned that living if you had a long commute home, you could roll the windows down and turn the music up and sort of decompress before you came home to be with your kids. Mm -hmm. And so we chose to live way out in the country so that when he got home, it was sort of off his chest. Wow. That made a lot of of sense, you know, Mm -hmm. Um, obviously, you know, my, my parents would each put, you know, 50,000 or more miles on their car a year because we just lived out in the middle of nowhere. Um, Wow. yeah, so he did that basically to give us give space between his profession and his family. So they definitely couldn't have leased cars because they would have been in the penalty. <laughs> yeah, we joke we joked that my mom would have gone through a lease in nine months. You know. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's so funny. Uh, just the uh, about a week ago, I turned on some random street. Your son name is Miles, right? Yeah, it is. Yeah, and I saw him in the street. I was like, oh, maybe this is where Clint lives. <laughs> yeah, yeah. My kids, are, I, you know, I get accused of being too much of a free-range parent, and my kids uh, can roam far and wide. They'll, they will go from my house to the office to the bakery, which is about 3.2 miles, which is a long distance for kids these days. Yeah, because where I saw him at, roam, that was a long, that was that's a pretty long distance. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's cutting across town, and so... Um, I mean, we know where they're going. They're not just like off the grid, but they okay. they do have they've earned the right and have proven themselves worthy to, to kind of go to those destinations. OK, so I have a buddy. His dad was a sergeant major in the Marine Corps. OK, now that if you hear that, that just sounds like strict. Now I hear your dad at this clearance, police officer. Where's the household for you? Was it strict? Like you, you couldn't do anything? Was it always rules or it was it kind of the free reign? No, in, in comparison, in fact, I was just having this conversation last week with a local professional um, who is about my age, uh, the difference of her childhood versus mine, and mine would be considered maybe severely free range. Mm. Um, uh, I, I probably thought it was strict, but I don't know what to, to compare it to, but um, uh, my brother and I behaved in a way that we had a lot of trust. Our parents trusted us. Mm. And so we could, we tried not to burn that. That was sort of our license to, to go out and roam and do our thing. And so if we said we we're going to be home, we were home. If we said we we're going to be somewhere, we were somewhere. We burned all the gasoline in the tank. We filled it up, that sort of thing. Mm-hmm. Um, my baby sister, not so much. She, uh, you know, she had pretty tight, tight reins on her because she, uh, did not earn a lot of trust in my parents. <laughs> she was a poor decision maker as a teenager. We'll put it that way. Okay. Um, okay. Yeah, but you know, we we um, you know, we had our wits about us, and um, and yeah, I would say that there wasn't a lot of rules. I don't remember being disciplined a lot. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I think that I probably got spanked three times in my life, and looking back, 
they were really earned. I mean, my parents really had the right to like give it to me, you know, when I was being disrespectful or whatever, but Mm -hmm. I got grounded one time that I can recall. And that's because I spent all my money on baseball cards and my mom thought I was obsessed. So she wouldn't let me, she took my baseball cards for two weeks to chill me out on my spending habit. But yeah, I just don't remember getting a lot of trouble. I just didn't want to, I didn't want to disappoint in particular, disappoint my mom. My dad traveled a lot. It was sort of like a, there were sort of levels. My parents didn't co-discipline like a lot of parents now, maybe more so even in my marriage where like at any given day, like I'm in sort of lockstep with what the kids are doing and my, my wife is and the kids might have to deal with either one of us on any issue. My dad traveled heavily and so it was like my mom was like the end all be all, right? And you mm-hmm. kept mom happy because that's who you dealt with. Yeah. Like mom was so frustrated that she couldn't figure out what to do with you. You went to the Supreme Court with the dad. <laughs> And that was bad. It was and you didn't bad, want to do that. Right? Yeah. No, I was just, I always thought he's just going to kill me and bury me out in the yard. And then all of his cop friends are going to believe him. And I'll, no one will ever remember me, which <laughs> never was happened. You know, yeah. never happened. But um, yeah, huh. that we, I didn't want to disappoint my mom. She worked really hard to, you know, take care of us in the house and, and stuff. So her punishment, the worst thing, for my mom, she would say is, I, I just don't, I don't care where you go, but I don't want to be around you. So I don't care if you go stand outside, go in the garage, go to your friend's house. But right now you're not the type of person I want to be around. <laughs> and as a teenage boy, I can remember thinking like, man, I've gone, that's bad. Like when your mom, your own mom doesn't want to be around you. I've messed yeah. up. And I felt really bad. Like I just, that was so disappointing to me that I had created a space for my mom. She didn't even want to beat me. She just didn't want to be around me. That hurts um, worse. It did. It was a really great punishment for a couple of teenage boys to just say, I don't even want to, I don't want to see you. I don't want to deal with it. So mm-hmm. as long as you, you, you know, I don't have to deal with you till tomorrow. I'm, I'm better. And so mm. that, that really would crush my spirit. So I just avoided that. I just didn't want to do anything that created that scenario. Okay. Now I overheard you one day and you were talking about music. Now, was it your dad that was into music? Yeah, yeah. My my dad is a phenomenally gifted musician. He's one of those people that can play anything by ear. Wow. Um, he, I mean, he can read sheet music, but I mean, he can really play any genre and, and mix genres and do all sorts of, you know, really free form music. And he um, had an aptitude for that when he was 14. He would um, asked to take drum lessons. He begged my grandparents to take drum lessons, and that sort of opened the the window to the music world to my father. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, music was when he was home. To this day, if he's home, there's music playing. Either he's playing the music, or the music is on the rate, you know, the stereo, and it's loud. And okay. so, there was just always music was just part of the rhythm of the household. So, when you're growing up, like what what are you hearing? Um, you know, one thing I notice about musicians is that a lot of them. Um, they listen to a lot of music. So was like on the radio or uh, stereo, what kind of sounds did you hear growing up as a kid? Yeah. You know, so my dad, um, has, uh, he's done a lot of things like side things that projects he was into. And I find that I'm similar. I got my hands on all sorts of projects, but he went during the seventies when he was in college, I'm a little fuzzy on the timeline, but when he was in college, I know, um, uh, he ran a radio show in Oklahoma City on AM radio, and it was a blues hour, and okay. it was the or a blues show, excuse me, and it was the first blues show, um, all blues show um, during the seventies, run by a couple of white guys. So you think about mm-hmm. coming out of the sixties, early seventies, a couple of um, white teenage boys running a, a, an award-winning blues radio show because mm-hmm. they like blues music. And so he was a bit of a novelty. Well, during that time, he accumulated an ungodly amount of records because they had to bring their own records to the radio station to play them. Oh, wow. And so um, record labels from all over heard how popular the show was and the sales in Oklahoma City of blues music were through the roof because of this radio show. So record labels all over would send their records to my dad and his best friend, and they still have a huge collection. So I grew up listening to blues records. Wow. On the turntable, yep. So your your dad just gravitated toward blues, or just that was the 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 choice of music that he liked best? Yeah, he. I I I don't want to forget which artist. It might come to me here in a minute, but he he recalls a time of hearing, and it dealt with drumming. 
when he was a young teenager, he heard a song that just captivated his heart with how the guy was drumming Mm -hmm. and thought, I don't know how he's doing that. Like whatever, I got to figure out what's happening there. Mm -hmm. He would listen to the song and listen to the song and try and recreate it and listen to the song. And um, that really got him into the music. And I think, you know, we all have impressionable uh, ch- times in our life or chapters or years or months or whatever where we're just, our mind is open, our heart's open or something, and those become sort of pivotal moments. And for him, whatever was going on during the 60s hmm. um, and blues music just caught him and uh, to this day captivates him. Wow. Okay. So music is going all around you. Yeah. Did you gravitate toward it? You know what? I, I have. Um, I, you know, joke, I've got better rhythm than most white people. Um, uh, and, uh, I think that had I had the attention that my brother had to sit down and focus on an instrument, Mm -hmm. um, I could sit down on a drum set and probably fool somebody. Um, but my brother really, um, is a hyper-focused individual and he gravitated towards the guitar when he was probably 12 or 13 and is a hmm. unbelievable guitarist really? and so he really was able to master that instrument and skill and i never i was more into mountain biking and and other stuff so but would you say your dad was a, a focus type guy or he was more like you more adhd type no no you know i'm uh my dad is much more focused than i am he's hmm. he's very i can get hyper focused on a task like if i've got a um Oh, I've written a couple of books. And so when I sit down to do that, I mean, I can literally just sit down and 12 hours a day, do the same thing over and over and over and over and over to get something done. Mm-hmm. Um, but um, I'm, I've not, very few things have captivated, captivated me for a year on in. It's sort of that boring, repetitive mastery. Mm. Um, stuff, in, stuff in business has, but music and sports, not so much. Yeah. And um, uh, my dad... I'm much more like my mom, sort of all over the place. And my dad is very much um, would, you know, he's learning the banjo now. Oh, oh wow. He's got all these cool instruments. banjo is very complicated. Um, and so, you know, he looks at it and says, okay, I'll give it a decade. And what he means is oh, like wow. Ten years, six huh? hours a day for a decade, you know, and then I'll see kind of how I feel about it. I, that's not me. You know, I'd wow. give it like two weeks ago. Ah, I kind of like this and I'm going to pursue it or ah, I'm bored. Bored is, yeah. Like, ah, I'll give it my 60s and see how I feel about it when I'm in my 70s, you know? Okay. Introvert or extrovert? Uh, Extroverted. You? Yeah. You wouldn't say a cross in between because I've seen your style. um, Like I always know when you make a post on social media. Yeah. If if you were, um, if I saw you make this post, you would make the post and it looks like you run away. Like, I never see you, I see you make the post, but I rarely see you respond back. So it's like, you put it there and you, (laughs) (laughs) you know, I, I view posting on Facebook. Most of the time, my goal is to make somebody smile. I think a lot of the stuff on social media is really negative and heavy or ignorant, or it's just not in the space of like, I want to, I want someone to read my post and just have a good laugh and be like, well, Clint's nuts, you know? Um, uh, but I... Um, yeah, I'll, I would say extrovert just because when I take the test, those all say extrovert. Really? Um, yeah, I do score well on all that. Um, mm-hmm. <clears throat> though, the older I get, Abdul, the more I I realize like if I'm in charge, I've got I've got control issues, massive control issues, and so if I'm in charge mm-hmm. of a situation, if I threw the event, yeah, I'm confident. Go meet anybody, talk to anybody, do anything. I if I'm that. asked to attend an event where I don't know what's happening, well, I want to hide. I'm I'm not a huge fan of that. Okay, so control is you for you is is basically keeping everything like you don't want you don't like surprises. I, I no, I really don't. You know, and I think that's really something I'm learning in my late 30s. It's just that hmm. I I'm not turned on by that sort of adrenaline of the unknown. Um, in fact, I traveled to Chicago recently with a friend. And they had planned an evening and said, you know, I'm going to surprise you. And I said, I just won't go like that doesn't for your personality. Maybe that sounds exciting, Mm -hmm. but I'm not going to be in a city. I don't know. 
ride in a subway I don't know to a building I don't know for some event, I don't, I'm not doing it. And I think Interesting. That, Abdul, it, go, it goes back for me of, well, it's sort of strange. I would say if it would make more sense if it was sort of across the board. Mm-hmm. Um, I could be uh, go to a ski area I've never been to, never look at the map and ski out of bounds and be comfortable and just be like, I don't know where I'm going. I don't know if there's a cliff up here or if I'll ever make it back. Like those, that type of unknown doesn't bother me at all. Yeah. But sort of being subjected to some other person's organized experience that I don't know what's going on uh, makes me nervous. And I think it kind of goes back and this is me being maybe a, a bit out of my qualifications on psychology, but mm-hmm. growing up with my father, we would play these games, these military games where, um, where we would hide in the house from intruders. So my dad uh, professionally trained people to uh, clear houses like SWAT teams and, and okay. extricate people. And so, you know, other people's dads played football with them. And, and, <laughs> and we did martial arts and ran mm-hmm. around with guns. And so, because that was my dad's world, you know? And my yeah. kids come to work with me and they think every dad's an entrepreneur. Like you just kind of fall into your, your whatever your parents are exposing you to. Okay. And so... We play these games of like situational awareness, and I remember the best way I can explain if you've ever seen the Bourne Identity. <laughs> um, yeah. When Jason Bourne in the first movie, he he pays the lady to take him to Switzerland, and they're sitting in the diner, and he's able to like name how much everybody weighs and the license plates, and hmm. uh, and this guy sitting on a stool and he's left-handed. We would play those sort of games to say, you know, my dad would say, "Close your eyes. Who's sitting at the table next to us? Who's three tables over? Where's the door? How far away from the door?" Holy crap. Got in a fight, could you pick up a chair? I mean, we would play all the time, all the time, all the time we play this. Wow. And we would hide in the house and he would pretend to be a bad guy and we would put ourselves in a safe situation and mm-hmm. and um that was his world. You know, I didn't know any different. I didn't know other parents didn't do this. It's just what you're raised doing. Interesting. And so I think when I go into a situation I don't know, I went to a women's award ceremony here in Sioux Falls, South Dakota, mm-hmm. at the pavilion, which is the big sort of arts uh thing downtown yep it's an award ceremony for women leaders i mean you're talking about one of the least scary events you can go to mm-hmm. it's all women i know but i didn't understand what was going on in the event they had to stand on stage for the they used the stage as like the place where all the hors d'oeuvres were yeah man i just found myself immediately like where's the exit where's my wife just all of a sudden found myself sort of like in this high trigger mode of like i don't know what the agenda is for tonight i don't know how long i'm gonna have to stand here i don't know where i'm gonna sit it was weird i had this sort of visceral reaction Hmm. And so I find in that I get really introverted. I don't talk to anybody. I don't know. I don't want anybody approaching me. Um, and that's gotten worse with age. It's sort of a weird thing. But if I was in charge of the event, I'd be calm as a clam, running around, shaking hands. But um, you, you, you strike me as a guy that if you're going to give a speech, you don't plan it. Unless you're like at home planning and then you show up like, I'm going to wing it. Like, I'm going to pre- make you guys believe that I haven't even touched this speech. Like, is, mm-hmm. am I seeing that correctly? Yeah, that's called sprezzatura. It's a great term you should look up. Mm-hmm. Um, a new term for you, sprezzatura. Sprezzatura. For your viewers, yeah. Okay. Uh, it's a made-up Italian term. This sort of, uh, 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 what do you call it? A nonchalant expertise. Um, uh, okay. Uh, I love, I'm, I'm an adrenaline junkie. I loved to mountain bike when I was a kid and ski and snowboard and um, we would do like rappelling and fast roping and rock climbing and, and that sort of stuff. And I did martial arts. And so I like the sort of adrenaline of, of battle. Mm-hmm. Um, and the adrenaline of speaking and tonight I teach a class here in an hour. Um, and I'm going to be up front of a bunch of people I don't know. Mm-hmm. And I love reading the audience. I know where I'm going with my points. Like I wrote kind of down, you know, I have the agenda for the class and so that it kind of the highlights of what I want to make sure they walk out the door with. Yeah. Um, but <clears throat> I can be very much in the moment watching facial expressions, body language, seeing if they get it, if they're not. I'm not afraid to go down a rabbit trail, abandon an agenda to tackle something else. And so mm. I like this sort, sort of like, and this is being an ADHD kid, you feel the more stimulus you have, the calmer your brain feels. You feel more focused. Okay. It's like okay. why kids take Ritalin, which is an upper. Mm-hmm. It stimulates their brain and they, they'll, the kid will tell you he feels calm or she feels calm. Yeah. And so for me, I feel... The more sort of anxiety of the moment, once it starts, I feel really relaxed and it feels like it's going in slow-mo and it's this nice little dance between me and the students. And so, yeah, I typically don't go in with like lots of notes. Otherwise, I get really nervous I'm going to misspeak or say the wrong thing or get off of my notes. I get very distracted by it. 
So when you're giving a speech, you're scanning the crowd to see what your emotion is, and then from that emotion, you try to craft what you're going to say. Yeah, based it feels on that. very much, and the best way I can equate it, and this might sound cheesy, but it feels very much like uh, doing jujitsu growing up. I mean, you're looking at your opponent. Are they left-handed, right-handed? Do they like to squat more, stand? Do they shuffle to the right? Do they look at your shoulders? And you're you're going to try and use their momentum and their energy to help you accomplish your goal, mm-hmm. right? And so if they want to attack you and they come at you, you're going to go with them instead of battle them. Yeah. You're going to go with them and use that momentum to be successful. Okay. And so I want to where's that momentum in the audience where's that momentum in the students is it is it a momentum of confusion is it a momentum of humor is it a momentum of whatever and try to use that energy out there to you know lead them in the right direction i know where i'm headed i know where i want what i want them to say when they leave mm-hmm. but the space in the middle i'm i'm willing to be a little bit messy same thing with the same thing with the you know if we were sparring yeah i know that i want to be on top and i want you on bottom and i'm going to choke you or whatever that's that's how it's going to end uh. in between there i'm not sure so what if it's a stiff crowd? They're not giving you any emotion. They're just sitting there just. Yeah, you know? I'm not. A, you know, I do have my dad's ability to be sort of like over the top wacky and sort of lo- getting them to loosen up. Mm-hmm. Um, I often will get to know a few people who are going to be in the audience beforehand so I can reference them. Like, hey, I was just talking to John. He said this, you know, ah, um, but so I had I, I was the keynote speaker at an insurance agent uh, convention, mm-hmm. two, two keynotes in the same day. And the insurance agents were we're just stoic and Mm -hmm. and on and on top of it abdul one of them decided he was going to heckle me and i was like thank god for the heckler because now i got something to focus on and while you were giving your speech say it again while you were giving your speech he wanted to do it he was doing yeah oh yeah yeah he thought we were in like a comedy club or something i mean he just he was just letting it loose from the crowd and i was just like bring it on buddy this is perfect interesting so I use that to kind of loosen up the crowd, but I don't have any problem like getting down there and taking somebody's stuff or sitting in their lap or moving something around and just sort of breaking those barriers uh, for people. Okay. So I'm going to give you a chance to pick one skill. Okay. I'm going to take away all skills and yep. this one skill you can use for the rest of your life. Mm-hmm. And and this is a skill that you, you feel like, I'm very comfortable with this. I can totally do this with my eyes closed. It's it's natural to me. What is that skill? Um, you know, I, I'd have to go to what my mom would probably say, and that is, and it's going to sound weird, but if you let me qualify it, mm-hmm. it's it's probably manipulation. Um, Interesting. And if you if you looked at manipulation as a negative, if you feel like you're being manipulated, you were like, that's a terrible circumstance. Mm-hmm. But the ability to take the variables and mold them and shape them in real time to have a certain outcome, mm-hmm. um, I have a propensity to do that really, really well. And as a child, I, I distinctly remember Bill being in the sixth grade, and I decided one day that I did not like the music teacher, mm-hmm. and I had her fired by the end of the day. As a sixth grader. As a sixth grader. And it was so easy to convince the administration to fire this lady. Holy crap. And my mom was like, well, now hang on a second. First of all, you probably ruined this lady's life. Mm-hmm. Uh, second of all, you need to, if you got, you got to use your powers for good instead of evil. You can't just go around ramsacking things. If you, well, I don't know what you as a 12 year old told a school administration mm-hmm. that they made a decision the same day and then not be, and not be libelous. And then I, I didn't accuse her of anything wrongdoing. I was just made a case that she wasn't a, a worthwhile teacher. Wow. And I realized at that point, like, hmm, well, that was kind of fun and it, and it worked really well, but I don't want to, I don't want to ruin anybody's life. Um, okay. And so, uh, you know, just yesterday I was with a client who was really dead set on what I thought was a bad decision for their business. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and very dead set. I'm talking adamant. I'm not changing my mind. This is where we're going. And, and I let her make her case. Mm-hmm. And then had her change her mind within probably thirty minutes. So holy um, crap, yeah, <laughs> that's so, that's pretty good. And so I think that that piece of it, um, I use. I am very cautious and cognizant mm-hmm. of that because I don't. I don't want anybody to ever think like uh, Clint's pulling one over on me, or uh, I don't want a yeah. negative experience. Mm-hmm. I don't want to get my way all the time. I, in fact, I. I pursue friends who challenge me. I, I don't like to be, I don't want to get my way, but I, I think that, um, you know, I'd give up walking or, 
or any of that kind of stuff pretty easily. I mean, if I had to survive, if I was put on the streets, no family, not knowing anybody in a big city, mm -hmm. it'd probably be that sort of like persuasion skills um, to get somebody to do something or mm. give me something or whatever that thing was. I, I would probably go to that one first. It's kind of a weird one. Interesting, though. I was sitting, there's a lot of conversations I've heard. So I, I was sitting and there was a guy that asked you about going to the bowling alley. Okay. And I remember your facial expression just went from like, you know, somebody said, hey, Abdul, you want to the bowling alley? You know, I'll be like, you know what? I'm not doing anything. Let's go to the bowling alley. But you, I noticed your facial expression. You became very serious and you said, I think the, I think the term you used, I don't do, um, Group activities, or something like that. Is it is that what you, the way you described it? Yeah, probably. <laughs> no, I don't, I don't do organized fun. <laughs> organized. Now, why is that? Because I I wanted to ask you then. I said, nah, it's not the place. Yeah, you know, no, you could have asked me there. I'm game for any discussion. I um, there's a piece of me, and again, someone's gonna watch this whole interview and be like, man, Clint, he's a therapist, but um, <laughs> I probably do, quite honestly. Uh, uh, I think growing up doing martial arts, competition is for keeps. You're, you're, hmm. it's not playful. When you're sparring somebody, you don't want to break their arm, though you could. Mm -hmm. I mean, you could, you could injure somebody. You could really hurt somebody. Yeah. Um, and it was very serious. It was, it was, if you're going to learn these skills, you, you have a huge responsibility to use this wisely. Mm -hmm. um, my dad was also a firearms instructor, so around guns. Um, I don't own any guns um, because I don't intend on killing anybody. Yeah. Because he would say, if you get this gun out, then you had best be prepared for somebody to die. That's why you mm -hmm. get the gun out. Exactly. So if you don't intend on killing anybody, don't touch a gun. Mm -hmm. And so it was just, there was no play fight. I can't run around. I, to this day, I couldn't run around and play squirt guns with my kids or laser tag or nerf because in my mind, you shoot people who you want to die, which is very black and white growing up with my father. And in competition, um, where other kids may have like run around and played soccer or kickball or whatever they did. Um, I'm psycho competitive. I'm very, very, very competitive, but I feel like I felt when I was sparring, which is like, um, I'm going to choke you out. Like this is going to end in the next three minutes. Okay. It's, it's not about being enjoyable. I got a job to do and, um, I'm not going to maim you, but, but I'm going to win. And I don't, I'm not fun to play with. So if I go to the bowling alley, um, everyone else is having fun and I'm like trying to kill everybody <laughs> with, you know, and they're just like, you're no fun. Mm -hmm. so I just learned to stop ruining my friend's evening. And I just like, anytime it's play, it's a game. I'm like, don't invite me. I'm, I'm not going to, nah, don't, don't invite me to play kickball. Cause I just want you to die and I want to win. And there's just, so I, I'm not, I'm not playful in that way. Yeah. And, and that's, uh. It's serious. I mean, I, I volunteered with youth programs, and I would tell the, the directors, like, I love refereeing. I'll set up cones. I'll clean the toilets. But don't put me on a team <laughs> because it's going to go from Clint Brown's playing with teenagers to Clint Brown's murdering teenagers in dodgeball. I just can't do it. So I sort of avoid it. You know, I, I thought about you the other day because I was watching a YouTube video. And I want to play it out for you. So a guy walks up to you, and he gives you a bucket. He's just walking up to you, and he's at he, and then you, you grab the bucket and then he walks away and you're like, OK, what is this guy doing? Then all of a sudden he, he walks around the corner, comes back with another bucket and he started throwing, starts throwing water balloons in you at you. And then you figure out that my bucket has water balloons also. So he instantly game of water balloons. Yeah. What would no. you do in that situation? Yeah, that would not go well for him. That would um, I, I'll tell you, I there's when you spend so many years training. Mm -hmm. I'm not ever, ever in circumstances where I ever feel like I have to use martial arts to defend myself or do anything yeah. ever in two balls. <clears throat> but I was in the coffee shop line and someone came up and put their arm around my neck to like give me that sort of like a bigger gentleman. I could tell by his presence. And the second he touched me, it was a larger human than me. And he just, you know, someone walks up and does the like, hey, how's it going? Yeah. And just like in a split second, I was around behind him with his arm. And without thinking, and he was like, God, dude, what are you doing? I'm like, what are you doing? Don't touch me. Like, <laughs> so, and I didn't even think about it. Like, well, like that wow. was scary that that many years later, effortlessly, 
I went from like thinking about my drink to holding this guy's arm just in a millisecond. Wow. And I went, I even called my dad. I go, that's kind of weird that that I've not had anybody try to, he wasn't trying to put me in a headlock, but it was that same. It felt, it felt like that. Yeah. It was just like, uh, an instinct or something. And so, yeah, I think if someone approached me, what I was thinking when you said someone you don't know is approaching me with a bucket, I could just see myself back and I'm like, whoa, 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 what are you? Like, I'm not taking that bucket. What is it all no, about? No, I don't know. Uh-uh. Because now I'm submitting to whatever the rules of this this situation are by by accepting mm-hmm. this from you. So I would probably, they'd have a hard time giving me the bucket, I'm guessing. Okay. So for the so for the audience, can you explain what you actually do? Because you do a number of things. <laughs> Yeah, I so if somebody that. came to you and said, hey, Clint, what do you do for a living? What would you yeah, say? Yeah, yeah. You know, um, so I had the fortunate opportunity to run this uh, large facility that's a, um, in all honesty, it's a professional and community development center. It gets mm-hmm. labeled as co-working. It gets labeled as collaboration. But in reality, I'm helping people develop their careers, mm-hmm. develop themselves, um, some of them very actively, like I talk to them every day, some of them through programs, and some of them just because they're in the space. Um, and I love seeing people increase their skill set, mm-hmm. increase their belief in themselves. And so I've had the fortunate opportunity to work in lots and lots of business situations, work with lots of clients. And so um, I find that kind of no matter what's thrown to me, I've either done it or have read about it or I know somebody who's an expert in it. So I love helping. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, um, so I spend my time basically um, running that business, either just very functional things like moving the chairs for an event mm-hmm. to um, actually sitting down with my customers and, and helping them grow their businesses. And there's, there's hundreds of them there. Yeah. Um, and then um, aside of that um, companies pay me, I get consulting dollars to help companies grow strategically. I've got a pretty uh, strategic mind. Mm-hmm. And so when companies find themselves in sort of odd growth situations, you know, they will make come in and see what's going on and see if I can help them make heads or tails of it. Interesting. Yeah. So, you, you know, we've talked before, you know, my stick is passion and everything. Do yeah. you believe in it? Do you believe that um, each individual has something special about them that maybe they have to develop into something? Absolutely. You know, I think I think, Abdul, <clears throat> there's a um, there's you know, I don't know where people fall religiously or what sort of like influences they have on the worldview. But in, in the Bible, there's a parable of uh, a man a, a, a boss giving his three employees what were called talents and that was a denominator in the Middle East a talent mm-hmm. and one he gave ten talents and one five and one one and said I'm going away on a trip to take care of my affairs when he came back the person with you know the two guys with the most talents had invested those talents and had the talents had multiply and one of them had buried his talent because he was fearful mm. and um and he was scolded for doing so. Mm-hmm. Um, and um, and I, I want to be caught using my talents. And I think, I think what's sad, Abdul, honestly, is a lot of people have, they're here for a purpose. Mm-hmm. Maybe they're, they've not looked for it or they don't believe it when they find it. Yeah. But I think that um, I want to be caught busy using what, what little talents I have for the people that I'm supposed to benefit and mm-hmm. bless. Um, I want to be caught doing that day in and day out by my children, um, by my wife, by my peers. And, um, yeah, I think that you'd have to, you have to believe, I don't know what it would be like to, to not believe that. I think, what do you think if you think that there's no purpose and you have no talent and no passion? Like, I'm not sure what rolls around. Why do you get up and go to work every morning? Yeah. Like I'm trying to think logically, like, well, if I, if I believe the opposite, well, I don't know. I don't know where you would. I do think I'm uniquely cut out for stuff. I'm uniquely not cut out for a lot of stuff. That list is long. The things I'm not good at. Um, but I've got a few things hmm. that I am drawn to and um, find a lot of fulfillment and purpose in doing. And I try to do that as much as possible, as many hours a day as possible. Okay, so we're going to wrap it up here in a minute. But I want to ask you, what is your talent? You know, I think that I think that. Um, where I, the feedback I get mm-hmm. is uh, probably in uh, giving people uh, permission and hope. Um, I think that there's not a lot of encouragement 
Um, people struggle to find encourage, encouragement, have someone challenge them and really say, you can step up, you can do this. Mm. And I find that I do that well when um, being an entrepreneur is in particular challenging. And yeah. some of the, you could have a day where all the variables seem negative. Like my, I got accounts receivable and this client's mad at me and my email server went down and you can have all these things and you could translate it like, God, oh, this is terrible. Mm -hmm. And I do a good job of sort of coming in, decompressing the situation, deconstructing it and saying, hey, in the spectrum, giving people giving people a context yep. and say, look, you have a pretty positive life. You're healthy. You got a great marriage. You got beautiful children. Um, your business is thriving. You're having a really terrible Tuesday or Wednesday, mm -hmm. but that's okay. Or you're having a rough month or a rough season. That's okay. <clears throat> and and sort of helping people um, uh, through the, the sort of triaging those situations. Um, I think that I'm, I'm really drawn to the messiness of that yeah. and, uh, and giving people the mental space to go, I can do this. I was, I could, I don't think I can do it 30 minutes ago, but I believe I can do it now. Mm -hmm. Um, I think I'm, I'm probably most drawn to that. Now I want to say something here is another thing I heard. Yeah. You gave a, a, a good explanation of an entrepreneur and oh, okay. you mentioned that a lot of entrepreneurs don't know this because, you know, we, a lot of times you go to come into entrepreneurship, there's no immediate result. Yeah. You said that sometimes that's uh borderline depression that comes with entrepreneurship. Can you, can you speak a little bit on that? Do you remember what you said about that? Hmm. I'm trying to think. Um, is there, is there more context you can give me? Well, I mean, you I mentioned something when you were talking about this, you were, you actually mentioned your father mm -hmm. when he was, when he basically what, um, I don't know what he went through can a period. Give me any pieces you can think of, and I'll. I'll I think he went through a it. period with, where he didn't have success or something for a while, yeah. and and then he just kind of fell into a depression, which, yeah. in entrepreneurship, is easy to do because let's say a person is starting out, they don't have much money, they're trying to get things going, yeah. they don't have immediate results, they don't have a lot of uh, wins. Mostly, it's just failure, 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 and then a win. But during those failures, depression can kind of set in a little bit. Yeah. You, you know where I'm going? You see where I'm going with that now? Yeah. I think that, you know, what comes to mind um, uh, is it, I heard one time that like entrepreneurs, it's how they translate their circumstances that sets them apart. Mm -hmm. And I think that um, uh, an entrepreneur, and, and I ask these kinds of questions when, when something happened that didn't work out as planned. Yeah. You'll hear somebody who's naturally entrepreneurial say that was a that was an expensive lesson to learn. That, mm -hmm. was, a tough, that was a tough lesson. Yep. Um, people who aren't entrepreneurial will often use the language like "I failed at this." It's very definitive negative. Where entrepreneurs go, "Man, that was difficult," but now I know better. Yep. And it's, they have this sort of irrational regrouping and persistence to just go. Yeah. That's I'm, interesting. Uh, to go back to it, I heard Steve Jobs interviewed with Bill Gates one time when he was alive mm -hmm. and they asked him like, why did you achieve your level of, of a success? And he said, I was just too dumb to stop. Every other <laughs> smart person quit when it, when this, all the signs pointed to quitting and I didn't see them and I just kept going. Mm -hmm. But I think that people can, it, I'm telling you, Abdul, that, that internal dialogue is really critical, yeah. especially because it can be very lonely. You, you're talking to yourself literally. Mm-hmm. Um, because your family may be against you and your banker may be against you and the market may be against you. Yeah. I've had moments where um, clearly I was the only person in my life who believed that I was going to pull this off. Um, and those are very, very difficult, lonely moments. Mm -hmm. And you have to kind of say, how am I going to translate this? What am I going to do with this information? Is this defeat or uh, am I stupid to move forward? Am I, am I prudent to stop or whatever? Mm -hmm. um, but I think that, um, uh, you know, I would say that people who uh, get down on themselves, if you had them explain what's going on in their mind, they're typically beating themselves up. Totally. They've got an internal dialogue that's really stinking thinking. Mm -hmm. And I will challenge people. I mean, I have people very close to me who get down on themselves and I, I say, what, what are the words in your mind right now? And they'll tell me and I'll say, who put, who put those words there? <laughs> <laughs> like who did you listen to that you mm -hmm. believe them so much that you remember that you you memorize that phraseology and you tell it to yourself you think about a great song or mm -hmm. a great poem how few of those are on your heart all the time like you might remember it when it's playing but how many of those are just are 
daily on your heart. Not many. Mm -mm. Or a verse out of a, a out of a te uh, uh, a religious text. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so few of those. And for someone to hang on to something, some sort of negative thinking, like I'm stupid or I'm not worthy or, or whatever, those are really powerful things. And so um, I think that people can get caught easily in the cycle. It's very stimulating to beat yourself up. Mm -hmm. um, and um, that's not the type of stimulus. And so I think it's one of those, I'll, you know, how I cope with it. And, and I've wanted to do a class for a long time on coping mechanisms. Mm -hmm. I think you got to have when life's negative, you have to do positive coping. Okay. Um, I see that. And so like, I'll go run, I'm doing something healthy. I'm outdoors. I'm moving. Mm -hmm. I could be having a really bad day. And it's amazing how by mile five, it's not so bad anymore. And like, I just kind of worked yeah. it out and had to talk with myself and found a good song to listen to. Um, uh, but you know, I did see, I did see my dad who is very, very good at what he does lose his government contract on his 60th birthday. Mm. And, then be too old. I mean, they can't say that. It would be illegal for them to say, "We're not hiring you because you're too old." But when all the other teams get hired and they're all guys my age, yeah, you know, he he's realized like, "Well, I'm sort of past my prime and I'm expensive because I'm an old dude." Um, and him sort of wrestling with that, like, "Who am I now? Mm. Where do I find my value?" Because Identity. for thirty years or thirty-five years or whatever, he was very, very valuable, um, and he's dealt with that and and has come out the flip side. Um, but um, in entrepreneur world, that could be nearly on a weekly basis. You have this sort of roller coaster of like, I'm crushing it and I'm getting crushed and I'm crushing it and I'm getting, you know. Yeah. And how you translate that's really critical. Yeah. Just for an entrepreneur, at least from my perspective, I've just learned to, I don't dwell in that, that depression state for a while. Yeah. I mean, if something bad happens, the first thing I'm thinking is like, man, let me get away from it. Let me go do something or let me. But I'm definitely not about to hear to turn on the slow music and kind of just sit there and just poor me. Nah, because if I did that, I would have quit a long time ago. Yeah. And I think the, the I mean, I don't know how crazy you want to get on this, but I think it's super selfish to do that. You've really turned the universe to focus on you. You've made your world about you when you're throwing a pity party because all of your thinking is you focused. You've yeah. stopped caring what your family thinks. You stop caring what your customers believe or the market believes. You're saying the whole, the universe feels the way I feel right now, which is a very self-centered uh, viewpoint. Yep. To think that that's it, it's globally true because I believe it's true, mm -hmm. right? Um, and I, you know, I think that people really got to slow down. And um, I think when someone's depressed again i go what what makes you think you're right like what makes you think you're right that you're doing that you're not good at this yeah. so you had a bad day my guess is you're um you haven't had protein in a while you're probably dehydrated underslept over caffeinated have low cortisol and high testosterone and you're or high cortisol and low testosterone and you're thinking negative about yourself you know interesting go for a run have a hamburger quit drinking beer and see how you feel in two hours mm. um, and and you'd be surprised how life might look a little bit different you know okay so last question yeah where would you like to see yourself in 10 years let's see 10 years I'll say, I, I gotta kind of go by all the children in my house so 10 years I would my youngest would be 11 um, man I would love to just you know go on a lot more dates with my wife that'd be nice mm -hmm. um, I think in 10 years, I think from a, from a, a, a business standpoint, I'm really going to be excited to see my children enter the business world. My two oldest mm -hmm. will be adults and, and really sort of getting their feet wet. I'm excited. I want to be there when that's happening. I want to play the game with them. Yeah. Um, or introduce them to the right people. Mm -hmm. And um, that excites me. Um, and, um, and I think professionally, I'm really in love with Sioux Falls right now. There's some mm. really positive changes that have happened here in the last five years. Okay. And I think the next decade is going to be even better. And so I would love to have a, a lot of influence on, on sort of the cultural awakening that Sioux Falls is going through. Mm -hmm. I'd love to be a part of that. And I, I, I look at it really as paving the way for, for my children. I don't, I'm not the mentality that says I'm going to make as much money as I can to leave it to my children. Yeah. I think that might be doing my kids a disservice, but I really would like to pave the way and bushwhack and say, hey, there's a lot more opportunities around here for you now that you're a young adult. And so 
I think mm. in 10 years, I'm, I'm probably, hopefully we'll be spending my time helping my kids explore their, their talents and how they're going to impact the world. Okay. I thought you were going to say something like uh, run for mayor by then or something. Who knows? Oh, gosh. You know, I'm the worst nightmare at a political thing. I mean, I'm just opinionated and mm-hmm. and I don't mind uh, crying foul. And I probably, I, I mean, who knows what life holds, but I, I can't see myself. I think I have more impact being a business owner, employing people, working with my customers than I do in, in that sort of arena, at least at this stage of my life. So uh, probably okay. not mayor. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you, Mr. Clinton. Um, I want to yeah. leave you with the last words of, um, is there any advice you would have for somebody who's just starting out in business and um, not real sure of themselves, doesn't know what it's going to look like in the future? What would you tell that person to kind of get them moving in the right direction? I think that they're going to really have to have the the story in their mind that that let's go back to that dialogue, that internal dialogue. Mm-hmm. What's the sentence you're telling yourself when it's going well, and and the sentence you're telling yourself when it's not? And mm-hmm. I would hope the sentence you're telling yourself when it's going well is uh, not that you're God's gift to mankind, but you've been fortunate enough to be in this situation to bring this sort of value to the world. Mm-hmm. And when it's not going well, um, you know, not beating yourself up. Uh, saying, hey, the, uh, these set of circumstances um, did not work out as planned, and uh, we're going to retool it and, and give it another try. So mm. um, I think deciding that up front and not being caught off guard two or three years in with those when it's heavy. Yeah. If it's not heavy yet, make, make good decisions when it's easy. Um, make a battle plan when it's easy instead of in the thick of it. Okay. Yeah. Well, thank you, Mr. Brown, for um, joining us today. Super fun. Yeah, and good luck on your uh, class today. Have you prepared for it, or are you just going to wing I it? I have. In fact, I hung a tire swing from the from the beam in the middle of the bakery, and I'm going to use a tire swing to teach about momentum in business. So um, okay. I've got to go. I, that starts here in a little over a half hour, so I'm going to go up there and and uh, put people. They have no idea what they're in for tonight, but they will be swinging on a tire swing in a class about business. So Interesting. I like that. I like that. Yeah, I got to keep it weird all the time. That's just my style. Hey, okay. Well, thank you again, Mr. Uh, Mr. Brown, for joining us. Yep. And um, it was it was fun. Yeah, thank you. This is super fun. And we've been trying to line this up for a long time. And I appreciate your persis- persistence. No problem. Thank you, sir. And for uh, those you. of you who have, um, who have watched this interview, whatever, I hope that you can find some great takeaways and to add some value to your life. So uh, we'll see you guys at the next interview. Take care.